What is the Bible? What is it worth? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Life is full of struggles and it is hard. But we are made in the image of God. Lord, I have to praise you to the moon and back. I don't see anything wrong with that. It's me you help. It's me you kill. It's me you move. It's me you groove. It's me you touch. I love you so much. Oh my Lord, I have to say thank you. Open your eyes. What do you see? Have you inventoried your life lately? Oh yeah, I have something else to say. Welcome to HBS and DWJ. Oh lordy lordy, to God goes the glory. God goes the glory, the glory, glory. All right. Welcome to HBS and DWJ. I am your host, Jerry Joyce. 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 All right. Our mission to provide the knowledge that will train sisters and brothers in Christ to spread God's love and create disciples. Our vision to share all resources that will aid in the knowledge necessary for the building of God's kingdom. The adversary does not know what to do with those who possess integrity. We are not human beings on a spiritual journey. On the contrary, we are spiritual beings on a human journey. With that being said, we will open this Holy Bible study session up with prayer. So please, join in. O Holy Eternal Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it is once again that we come unto you as humble as we know how, realizing that We were destined for hell after the fall of mankind, but you, loving us the way you do, gave us a way out through redemption. You brought us out of a horrible pit of despair, out of the merry clay of mud, and set our feet upon a solid ground of rock, and established us as we walk along this side of life. All we have to give you is ourselves. Help us to retain what you have for us in this world. Thank you for your continued graces and mercies. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Time for today's Giggle Box. (laughs) Two little boys were known troublemakers, stealing everything they could get their hands on, even from the church. One day a priest stopped one of the boys and asked, Where is God? The boy shrugged and the priest repeated, Where is God? The boy ran out of the cathedral, crying on his way home, where he hid in a closet. Eventually, his brother found him and asked, What's wrong? The crying boy replied, We're in trouble now. God is missing. And they think we took him. Do you know what time it is? It is time for... Oh, oh no, no, say it ain't so. so. According to WUFE967.com, that is WUFE967.com, a group of Jewish organizations in New York baked a 35-foot long loaf of Holla. That's right, 35 foot long loaf of holla last week in the hope of setting a new world record. Holla, a braided bread, is traditionally served on Shabbat and other Jewish holidays. The website My Jewish Learning Notes. 
The Jewish Federations of North America, that is JFNA, headquartered in New York City, along with the Orthodox Union, teamed up to attempt to break the record for the longest holla, JFNA told Fox News Digital on Wednesday. All right, blessings to all. Welcome again. I am Jerry. This portion of our studies co- study covers the capture of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Battle of Kings, Part 2. The five kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zor, have gathered their forces to take their stand against the eastern kings. The battle, apparently, doesn't last long. The five kings are defeated, and their forces flee, some falling into the tar pits in the region. Others escape into the hills. The enemy raiders descend on Sodom and loot all of their possessions, provisions, and many of their people. Here is where the story of this war connects to the story of Abram, who would later be renamed Abraham. Abram's nephew Lot was living in Sodom at the time. After separating from Abram to prevent their growing families from competing for resources as found in Genesis chapter 13 verses 8 through 9, as a part of this new war, the kings of the east captured Lot and all of his possessions before heading back toward their homeland. A survivor of the carnage comes and tells Abram Abram, uh, what has happened. Without hesitation, Abram who is more than 75 years old at the time, according to Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, gathers 318 servants trained for battle, along with three Amorite brothers who were his allies. Together, they chase down the eastern armies, finally catching up to them in Dan at the far northern edge of Canaan. What could Abram's small army do against this force that had conquered all in their path without a loss? With God's help, they could win. They do so in one night, using clever tactics as part of their rescue. Abram's forces chase down the enemy farther to the north and retrieve Lot, all of his possessions, and everything else the eastern kings had plundered along the way. All right, it is now time to open our hearts, minds, and souls to the Word of God. Our scripture will be coming from Genesis chapter 14, verses 7 through 12, King James Version. That is Genesis chapter 14, 7 through 12, King James Version. Let's read. And they returned and came to an Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazes on Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Atma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Sidim. With Keterlaimer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. All right. Let's see here. Now we've done the um, the uh, scripture readings. We'll do our um, verse breakdown. Starting with uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 7. And they returned and came to in Misphat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazon, Tamar. Um, in Misphat, or in Mishpat, I should say, 
This apparently earlier name means spring of judgment. Kadesh would later become a testing time for the children of Israel as they traveled in the desert. The previous verses described how four eastern kings, led by Kedorlaomer, king of Elam, went to war against the city-states in Canaan in response to a rebellion against their rule. Their route took them south along a uh, line east of the Jordan River, defeating all in their path all the way to the edge of the southern wilderness at El Paran. Next, they turned back to the north and west, defeating in Mishpat, Kadesh, along with the um, Amalekites and the Amorites in the region. That would have brought the four kings at last to the southern end of the Dead Sea. There, the five kings of the city-states in that region had gathered in the Valley of Sidon to await their attack, as we can find in Genesis chapter 14, verse 3. In the verses to follow, it will finally become clear what all of this has to do with God's man, Abel, who was living in the region. Specifically, the connection is to Abram's nephew, Lot, who has chosen to live very near to one of these rebelling cities, Sodom. And we can find this information in Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 12. All right, let's move on to Genesis chapter 14, verse 8. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zor. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. All right, now the previous verses describe the war of the four kings of the east, led by Kedorlaomer, king of Elam, against the city-states of the peoples of the land of Canaan. Defeating all in their path, their route took them south along a line east of the Jordan River all of the way to the edge of the southern wilderness before turning back north to defeat Kadesh and the peoples south of the Dead Sea. Now the four kings come to the valley of Siddim to do battle against five kings listed in this verse. Those five kings include the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. It would be helpful to remember that Abram's nephew Lot had pitched his tents near the city of Sodom as described in Genesis chapter 13. This puts his family directly in the paths of this counter-revolutionary army. Alright now, let's move on to Genesis chapter 14 verse 9. With Kedolaomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. We have in verse 8 the mention of Sodom, where a lot dwelt, and which causes the interest of Jehovah, and points to the reason for all this being included in these passages. It is obvious from the text that Lot was not at all in proper relationship with the Lord. However, the Lord, despite that fact, continued to monitor his every move, in effect to exercise a form of security and protection for him, despite his having moved in with the Sodomites. Every believer should understand the significance of all of this. For before we became believers, God was with us the same way. We are brought, or we are bought, a, uh, should I say, with a price. And that price is the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, now in this passage, four kings of the east, led by Caterlema, king of Elam, have gone to war against the city-states and peoples of the land of Canaan. Now, um, this in response to rebellion among these Canaanite tribes, so far, the enemy has defeated everyone in its path. A southerly line east of the uh, Jordan River all the way to the edge of the southern wilderness. Then, this counter-revolutionary force turns back north 
to defeat Kadesh and the people south of the Dead Sea. Now the four kings listed in this verse came to the valley of Siddim to do battle against the five kings of the city-states grouped at the southern end of the Dead Sea. Those five kings include the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. Apparently the battle won't last long since the Bible only describes the aftermath rather than the battle itself. Alright now let's move on to Genesis chapter 14 verse 10. And the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. All right, the slime pits were asphalts, apparently crude oil. The kings fell into the sense of being totally defeated, not killed. Asphalt still tends to surface in the south end of the Dead Sea. Asphalt pits, the Hebrew term for pits is written twice, pits, pits, meaning that bitumen pits were everywhere. The previous verses in this uh, chapter set up a showdown between the four eastern kings led by Kedar Laomer, uh, king of Elam, and the five kings of the city-states grouped around the southern end of the Dead Sea. Now these five kings were rebelling against Kedar Laomer's uh, dozen rule over them. After uh, all that set up though, the text tells us nothing of the battle itself, as I mentioned before, because uh, apparently it didn't last long. Okay, now the forces of the four kings from the east were strong, and they had already defeated several peoples and places along their route without ever suffering any loss that we know of. Now, the uh, five kings of the southern Dead Sea region were no match for them. The Valley of Siddim where the battle took place was full of bitumen or tar pits. A petroleum substance apparently oozed up from under the ground there. An interesting point to consider when one looks ahead to the fiery destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the near future, as found in Genesis 19. Ooh, burn, baby, burn. Well, on the run from the forces, um, of the four eastern kings some of the men of the five kings fell into those tar pits as mentioned before and the rest ran into the hills that sloped steeply up from the Dead Sea to the east and west in any case the five rebellious kings were thoroughly defeated alright now let's move on to Genesis chapter 14 verse 11 and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. They remove all the animals, food, stores, and subjects of the city with the intent to take them back to Babylon. The five kings of the city-states group near the southern end of the Dead Sea, including Sodom and Gomorrah, took their stand against their eastern overlords. They lost. In fact, their loss seems to be so thorough that the Bible makes no mention of the battle at all. Of, of course, the battle itself. Instead, the narrative skips directly to the aftermath, which includes the rebellious forces fleeing into tar pits and hiding in the wilderness. The four kings of the east literally sent the forces of the five rebellious kings running away. Afterwards, the forces of the eastern kings looted the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for all of their possessions and provisions, leaving the people destitute. Among those taken in this plunder are Lot, the nephew of Abram, who has recently moved into Sodom, as we can find in Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 12, as well as Genesis 14, verse 12. Speaking of, let's move to it. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Lot, in his compromised position, could neither deliver Sodom nor himself. The only way to help and bless the world is to live apart from it in fellowship with God. 
Lot lived in Sodom and was taken captive. The reason this war is significant to the record here is that it reveals what Abram is going to do in connection with his nephew. After routing the five rebellious kings in a battle, the forces of the four kings of the eastern cities sack Sodom and Gomorrah. They take all the possessions and provisions, leaving the people destitute. This brings us to the moment where this war story crosses paths with God's story of the people of Israel. The four kings also took Abram's nephew, Lot, and all of his possessions. It's important to note that Lot was now living in the city of Sodom, a place known for its obscene wickedness, according to Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. When we last saw him in Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, Lot had settled his family near Sodom, and at some point then, he and his family moved um, into this town where the people were known for their wickedness. And we're not told why. Clearly, though, Lot has grown accustomed to Sodom's sin, at least to the point where he is comfortable living in the middle of it. Now Lot and all he owns has been taken away by eastern armies, creating another opportunity for God to prove himself faithful to and through Abram. Well, well, well. All right. Do you have the complexion for the protection? It is now time for our life reflection. All right, our God is for us. He is working out every circumstance for our ultimate good. He chose us before we ever knew him and destined us to be called justified and glorified, according to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. God being for us means that nobody can ever bring any accusation against us and make it successful. God has already, adjust, has already justified us. Christ stands by making intercession for us in that he paid for each and every sin with his own blood. And this is in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 through 36. That brings us back to where we started. Nothing. No matter how terrible, no matter how powerful, can ever separate us in any way from God's love for us in Christ. But for now, that's what the capture of Sodom and Gomorrah, the battle of kings, is all about. With that being said, we will close out with prayer. All right. Oh, holy, eternal. Heavenly Father, Son, Holy Spirit, thank you for blessing us with another building block from this Holy Bible study session. We should realize that you are working to complete a purpose in us that you set out to do before you even formed the world. That purpose is to make us Christ-like, and you are still using all things to finish this process. You foreknew us, predestined us, called us, justified us and will glorify us thank you for your continued graces and mercies O oh lord our strength and our redeemer we continue to pray these things by believing trusting and loving you O oh, holy eternal father son holy spirit it is always in the precious name of jesus the christ the messiah we pray amen all right, thank you for tuning in. Please stay tuned for the discussion portion of the show. You can message us at 704-412-8692. That's 704-412-8692. I would like to thank iHeartRadio for this opportunity. Thank you, iHeartRadio. You can find HBS and DWJ Podcast most anywhere you receive your podcast. And you can also find HBS and DWJ on our website at www.GodInOurLivesEveryday.com. That's www.GodInOurLivesEveryday.com. Or just hashtag HBS and DWJ. That's hashtag HBS and DWJ. Feel free to check out the HBS and DWJ store on GodInOurLivesEveryday.com. All right, remember to put God first, and everything else will follow. Appreciate your steps in life. They are the reason you can look back at where you came from. 
to God goes the glory, the glory, glory.